So I get to preach to you for a few moments. Amen. Amen. I get to preach for a few moments with you. I think I should be sitting on Mother's Day, but they gave me the, the chore of um, preaching to you. But I'm grateful because it's always an honor and a privilege to stand before you to declare the goodness of the Lord. But this morning, I want to talk to you about making an impact on the generations to come. Okay, paving the way for the next generation. That's our job. And I know that you fathers are here, but I'm sure you could ride on something that I say this morning. Because even though we're talking to mothers this morning, the fact is we're parents. And what applies to us, except for the breastfeeding part, applies to all of us as we parent together. Amen? So this message really, even though it's for women, really is for everyone. Even if you're not a mother this morning, you and you're a woman and you have any experienced motherhood, you have an earnest deposit in you. An earnest deposit of motherhood is in you because you carry a womb. So even though you've never given birth, the earnest is still there. And so you, um, you, know, you can join us this morning and celebrate with us as we do this. Uh, you know, this is, it's difficult. I don't know if you all agree with me, but it is difficult raising children in this generation. It is so difficult. It is so much different when I was growing up or even when I was raising my children. I am now a grandmother of 14. I have 14 grandchildren. But it is so different. You know, back then when I was raising my children, we had parental authority. They don't, you don't have parental authority anymore. They tell you, if you do this, I will call that. They need, they're in the wrong house, but okay. That's what happens, you know. Um, we didn't have cell phones. I didn't have cell phones. We didn't even have, we had, when, phone, when cell phones first came out, it was so huge. I don't know if y'all remember, you can literally hit and kill somebody with it. Now, you're walking down the street and everybody's on a cell phone and they talk like they're in their living room. I don't understand it. But that's the change from one generation to another. And then they have the web. We have Facebook and TikTok and, and, and YouTube and all the stuff that we never had. We never experienced that. Every app in God's given earth, you can download an app for just about every living thing now. We did not have to deal with any of that stuff, you know, and we're not even going to talk about the 7,000 channels on the TV. Y'all remember at midnight when all the colors came down and what we heard is, oh, say, can you see? It was the national anthem, okay? Maybe that's why all of us know the anthem. You know, nowadays, the kids don't even know the national anthem anymore, but in our day, TV stopped. So if you wanted to watch TV after 12, you'd be up the creek with no paddle. Because there you just, it just didn't happen in our generation. We played outside. They don't play outside anymore. They're inside on the, on their devices. This is how they look, okay? I mean, and, and they probably feel sorry for us. We feel sorry for them, right? That's how it works. <laughs> But, um, and then we're not even going to talk about privacy. Lord have mercy. There is no such thing as privacy. Do you know that? Everything is out there. I don't know, when I was growing up, they said, keep your business home. They don't know that. This, everything is out there. I have a cousin that I love daily. And I hardly get to talk to her, but I don't need to. I don't need to. All I need to do is look at her Facebook. I know everything that is going on in her life. I don't understand it. And you know, I was thinking about this one. I was thinking how when we took photos, we had to wait to see those photos. We had to take the film to get it developed, right? And then we had to go pick it up. So it took you like a week, maybe even two, before you saw those photos. Before you even press the button now. It's ready to go. But you see the difference with the generation? But we have to contend with this generation because no matter what the difference is, we still have to impact that generation for Jesus. So nothing changes. 
how time has changed. Time has really changed. But our responsibility hasn't changed. No matter what is going on in our world, our responsibility as parents have not changed. And so with that, let me just pray. Father, thank you right now for your anointing. Thank you for your presence in this room. Thank you for every mom that's here, Lord God. And God, you know what we need. I thank you because you're so faithful that you would even want to use a broken vessel as me, God, so that I can impart to your people. God, you love them so much that, yes, you would even use me. So, God, here I am. Use me for your glory. God, let the words, oh God, of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to read Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7, and then I'm just going to talk to you for a little bit. Amen? Psalm 78, verse 1 says, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders, for he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so that the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children so each generation should set its hope anew on our God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and command and obeying his commandments. And that is what the Lord is saying from, for us in Psalm 78. Our responsibility, can I have some water? Our responsibility is to make sure that the next generation knows about the mighty acts of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done, what he's doing, what he will do. We have the responsibility to do that. We have to teach our children, and we have abdicated that. If we are, been, if we are honest, we have not done the best job at times in doing what the Lord has commanded us to do. We ought to raise our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. That's what God says. He says, if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. It's okay for discipline to take place, but now discipline has become a dirty word. And discipline and abuse is two different things. I want to make that clear. Because your children are not punching bags. You can't, and it's not, it's not just physical abuse, but it's also verbal and emotional abuse that we ought to be very careful of as we disciplining our children. But discipline, we must. But as I'm thinking about this, I think about three Areas in which we order train our children. And yes, it's Mother's Day, so we're talking mostly about this today. Um, but I know that you'll be blessed. The first area that I believe that we ought to impart to our children, or what our children need from us, is our example. They need our example. We ought to be purposeful in the way we live our lives before them. We ought not to be hypocritical in the way that we live. We're not asking for perfection. We need to be authentic. But they need to see a measure of Jesus in our lives. They ought to look at our lives and want to mimic us and to serve the God that we serve because we walked that way before them. Amen? We ought to do that. We ought to show them how to live a god fearing life that they can imitate. They need to be able to look and imitate. Look at me and do likewise. Let me tell you, it's terrible when I see, I don't know how you all feel about this, but when I see a grandmother, maybe even older than I am, you know, dressed with really short skirts, something is wrong with that picture. You know, like your day, you passed that time. 
you got to start looking now. You, you're a grandmother now. Let, let's, let's turn the page and let's begin to walk in the way that we, we ought to walk so that they would have something to look at. Amen? Amen. Amen. We really... We... <laughs> But we're not talking about, we want to live in a way that they want to mimic or to imitate us. But we're not talking about the crazy religious way either. Because there's a balance in everything. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. But a just way to his delight. He wants us to live a balanced life. And so in that, we don't, we want, we don't want to be crazy spiritual either. Everything is... You know, you know, I just... I'm asking you for food. Like, what does that have to do with food? And then you get into, oh, rabba, ba, shabba, taba. No. I'm asking you. No, we really have to be, we have to be honest with ourselves. Who wants that? We will be going in the opposite direction. We want to make sure that what we show them they want to imitate. I don't want to imitate that. I remember sitting with someone for coffee in, in a restaurant once, and I was just simply talking. I, I took the tea to drink, and, and I, my tea, and it was a mess. And listen, I'm not saying, let me, not, let me just clear this up. Praise the Lord. Let me just clear this up. I'm not saying if you feel the spirit and you do this, bless you. You understand? But you can't do that every day, all day long. You can't have a conversation. You know, train up the child in the way that they should go. Show them how to go. I can be in the mall shopping, seeing something I really love and want to buy. In the middle of that, I could stop and lead the money to Jesus. I don't need all of that stuff. I need to be naturally spiritual and spiritually natural. That's my example. I should be able, in the middle of my shopping, or if I'm at a restaurant eating, and someone, you know, there's some kind of demonic activity, I should be able to get up right from my table, walk over and say, come out in the name of Jesus. I don't need to turn the whole restaurant upside down. We got to live in a way that the next generation want what we have. And they don't want craziness. And God doesn't want craziness either. Be balanced in all things. Be spiritually natural and naturally spiritual. Amen? Amen? Those are the things that we need as we walk through, you know, the, um, walk through the process of giving an example. We ought to show unconditional love. That love that never gives up. All that is just our example. Show them how to love. How do you love unconditionally? There's no greater love beside that the love that Jesus has for us that a parent had, that a parent has for his child. That is the unconditional love. Your child could do all kinds of stuff. They make you cry. They make you go places you never thought that you would go. But you still love them because they are your children. And you are going to go there, do whatever you need to do. Borrow whatever you need to do. Move whatever you need to move. Because that's your child and you're going to make sure they know that you love them. Now, I make it clear to my children, I'm not coming to jail to visit you. Now, there are some circumstances where things happen, and you, I understand that. There's exceptions to every rule. But if you go and you play a fool, I didn't train you that way. You want me to find money, bail money? No, you, you need another mom. <laughs> He need another mom. But we ought to love them. And that means going places we never thought we would. I'm telling you, Bishop and I, we got some stories to tell you about loving unconditionally. We know what that means. So when I stand here to tell you, I know what I'm talking about. I know when you have to leave the 99 and go after the one. I'm talking about both spiritual and natural children. I know what that's like. But it doesn't a heart. Your heart beats for your children and you want the best for them. And, and so that an expression as we walk in the example is that unconditional love. You know, as I'm thinking about the unconditional love, I'm thinking about the prodigal son. That is an example of unconditional love where even though, you know, first of all, you, you're not coming to me to ask me for what I have. You didn't give me anything to hold. So you're not coming to me to tell me, 
Give me what's mine. I'm out of here. But the prodigal son does that. He goes to his father and he says, give me what's, uh, what's mine. What, what's mine? Give it to me. I want to go. And the father gives it to him and waves, it, waves him by. I'm sure the father's heart is aching when he does that. But he knows that that's part of loving your children is letting them go. And, but he also knew that the love of the father was there because when he messed up, when he crazy messed up, he knew that he could come back home because he knew that love was waiting for him. And I think that that's part of our unconditioned love is expressing that to our children. And I tell my children that all the time. I have rules at home. I don't care how old you are. I have rules. If you're home, then you, you got to abide by these rules. And if you don't, we're in trouble. But if you're going, I want you to know that if you find yourself anywhere in life with nothing to eat or nowhere to live, the door is always open at home. But when you come home, the same rules you left it will still be waiting for you. But we have to understand that as we, we, we express this, as we give the example, as we walk in the example of, of being a parent, especially that of a godly parent, our example is very, very important as we walk before our children. And that's so important that I can't even stress that enough. But love is sacrificial. You know, love is unconditional. And love is not hypocritical. You have, we have to make sure that our example stand, walks, as we walk before them, that there's an example for them to look at. Amen? Remember that we are either teaching them how to be or how not to be. I want my children to look at me and see how to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second thing I want to teach my children is we're, we're, we're still in Psalm 78, okay? And these are the different things that the Bible commands us to make sure that we pass on to our children. The second thing we want to do is our values. Our values is the things, the principles that we live our lives by. The very first thing is, is the golden rule. It's in Matthew 7 and verse 12. It says, do unto others whatever you would like them to do unto you. So if we live by that golden room, we're going to be okay. Because we would have done right by people. But we can't treat people anyhow and, and expect to be treated nicely. No, it doesn't work that way. You treat people the way you want them to treat you. That is one of our values that we live by and we teach our children. And I also, I believe that many of you here also believe that. But I want you to, um, just to hear so that you can uh, tighten up in areas that you need to tighten up. Amen. We all are a work in progress. Amen. Amen. The second thing is, well, this is part of, this is just a sub point from our values is um, diligent versus lazy. Proverbs 12 and 11 says, a hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. He is a fool. Diligent. We ought to be diligent and not lazy. Not lazy. Amen? Choose integrity. We believe in integrity. We believe, and Proverbs 9, 10 and 9 says, people with integrity walk safely, but those who walk a crooked path will always be exposed. First Chronicles 19 and 7 says, I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity in our hearts. You know, I want them to also know to be generous. Be generous. Generosity is a good thing. Those are the, the values we want to impart to our children as we're raising them up before the Lord. Don't be impulsive. Be self-controlled. Don't be disobedient. Be obedient. God loves obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't, don't be hurtful to people. Be kind to people. Don't be prideful. Be humble. James 4 and 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Don't complain. God hates complaining. Complaining is like, it's like foul languages in God's ears, like cursings in God's ear. We are a complaining community. We love to complain. When it's hot, it's too hot. When it's cold, it's too cold. You want this. When we have this, it's not enough. We're always complaining. We always want more. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. And God, that doesn't please the Lord. We ought to be 
be grateful in our hearts as we walk through these things and our children are watching us, whether we're complaining or we're grateful, our children are watching us and we want to make sure that we line up with what God word so that they can see God, they can see Christ in us. Be respectful, that's another thing. We have to learn to be respectful. You can't even correct people anymore. You know, they used to be, in my day, they had mothers in the house, you know, but, and the mothers could just come to you and they can correct you with love. They would correct you. Now, the parents are going to beat you up. Now you can't, people want, they want to, but it is our job as mothers. The, the Bible tells us that we ought to, to help the, the younger ladies to grow up in the way of the Lord. It is our job to do that. But now it's hard to do that because the generation it's a whole different thing. You can't talk anymore. And we ought to change that so that they can, so that uh, together a village can raise our children and they can have that, what they need. Amen? Amen. James um, 1 and 4 talks about persevering because this persevering produces character. I want my children to have character. You know, they're mature. They don't give up easy. You know, you run away from everything. You can't. Life is full of challenges. But you've got to stand up and you've got to face the music. You've got to walk it through and get your badge of honor when you've done what you're supposed to do. Nobody gets any award for quitting. There's no award. The prize is always ahead of you. You've always got to be pressing forward, moving ahead, keeping your eyes on the thing that matters, the thing that you set out to in the first place. You've got to keep your eyes on it because it's never behind you. And quitting should never be an option. You can rest for a while, but quitting is not an option. We can't give up. I want to tell them, don't chase money. Don't chase money. It will make you compromise. You ought to ch chase purpose. That's what we ought to chase, purpose. When you chase purpose, you become a money magnet. But if you chase money, you're going to end up in places you, could, you didn't even think. You'd be there wondering, how on earth did I get here? Money will elude you. You know, that's why 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money. Money, money, money is money. It's free. It doesn't care. It's the love of money that gets us in trouble. It's the love of money. And we ought to be mindful, you know, not to chase money. Chase purpose. When you chase purpose, all the things that you need is going to chase you down. And if you know that, you will do that. Uh, Proverbs 23, verses 4 through 5 in the message says, Don't weigh yourself out trying to get rich. Restrain yourself. Riches disappear in the blink of an eye. Wealth sprouts wings and it flies away. And you're standing there wondering, what happened? You know, did you ever find yourself like you're always this close, this close, this close? And you're like, I almost, that's, that's the story of your life. It's, I almost. Almost, almost, no. Chase purpose. When you chase purpose, the things you need, you'll, it'll come to you. Amen? Live a disciplined life. Work is good. God created Adam to work. Work. Be content in every season you find yourself. Don't be running after the Joneses. Thank God for the Joneses. Let them celebrate what they have. You wait for your turn. Your turn will come. But be content when you find whatever season you find yourself in. Philippians 4.11 says, I am Paul saying, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have, no, I have learned to be content wherever the circumstance, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Those are the values we ought to deposit into our children. We have, we, you're, if you're chasing happiness, you're chasing waterfalls. You're not going to catch it. Amen? I want, my, my, I want to tell, the, another value is I want to tell, well, most of my children are married now, but 
I do, and I think that's something that we ought to tell our kids is when you're choosing a life mate, how do you choose your life mate? You know, don't think about a good night. You got to think about a good life. You're going to have the rest of your life to figure out the night. You got to go after a good life. A good life, not a good night. When you're looking at someone, see possibilities. Where can this relationship go? What would it do for me? You know, how is she with her friends? How is he with his friends? I remember when I was... I remember when I was... Uh, we didn't even date y'all, but okay. But when I met him and... Um, I didn't really like him, to be honest with you. <laughs> I married him, but okay. Uh, but I remember I saw how he was void of any emotional connection. You know, so we went to the same church and we would all go out together in a group. Praise the Lord. That doesn't happen anymore either. But <laughs> that was our generation. But, and when we did that, we, um, you know, I would see how he was. He made folks laugh. You know, he, was, he, he would open the doors. He would make sure that the ladies got home safely. Those things I saw before, I saw him. You know what I mean? But if you're not, if you're just thinking about how fine she is or how many muscles he got, you're not going to see that stuff. And what really matters, you're going to miss. So don't worry about that. Don't think about a good night. Think about a good life. Amen? You got to see the world. Let the world, let the let, see the world from, from, from the lens of the scriptures. That's one of the values I always want to give my children. You've got to have a biblical worldview. Because if you don't, then you have a liberal worldview. And you're going to be dancing to every tune and you're going to be tolerating everything. And the only thing I know that tolerates everything is a garbage can. It's the only thing. You can't tolerate everything. You have to have some lines that you draw in the sand. You've got to have some boundaries. You've got to say, no, I am not going to do this. I'm not going. But if you don't have any principles or any foundation in which to stand to make those decisions, you're going to be dancing to every tune you hear. And I don't want that. I don't want that. I want you to be sound, you know, full of wisdom. As you're making decisions about your life. Amen? And the third thing I want to talk about is I absolutely must give is our faith in God. I must give my children faith in God. My faith. The Bible tells us, and I read it in, in that we ought in Psalm 20, in Psalm 78, we ought to tell them we have to remind them day in and day out because, you, you know, the, the average person doesn't hear something unless they hear it 11 times anyway. You got to keep beating it and beating it until it gets into them that they be, not everything they do is colored by this. But we have to give them the word of God. We have to give them the faith, the God that we believe in, the same God of Jacob, the same God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the all oh, the God of David come right down. I'm telling you, I am only standing here because somebody prayed for me. I didn't just get up one morning and decide I'm going to get saved today. It doesn't work that way. I remember years ago, Someone came to the church years, years, years ago. We were still in Mount Vernon. And they said, Pastor Mont, I got up. And I said, I'm going to get saved today. So he really did. He, you know, he said the prayer. But about two weeks later, we, we couldn't find him. Because that was all him. Somebody prays for you. And when you have a moment with the Lord and you encounter him, everything changes. I remember the day I got saved. I remember the mess that I was in and how God took me. I don't think that I would be standing here today 
if God didn't find me in the mess that I was and pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground and say, I am going to use you for my glory. Only God could do that. A broken, messed up individual like myself. I need to tell my children. They need to know. Oh, they need to know how good God has been. He's been too good. You know, there's a song that I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. God has been too good to me. I know where he brought me from. I know that I was going to lose my mind. I remember that day when I was standing in that bedroom and I was waiting. I said, as soon as he falls asleep, I'm out of here and I'm not going to look back. And I'm telling you, I stood there and it was one o'clock and two o'clock and three o'clock. And then I heard complete silence. I said, here's my moment. And I tell you, I got out the house. I had no shoes on my feet. I did not care. But I'm telling you, I know where God has brought me from. And I need to tell my children, they need to know that God, I'm only here because he's been good. And I need you to take it just when Paul said, Paul says, I, I, I know who you are now, uh, Timothy, because I remember your grandmother, Louis, and then uh, your mother. You see, that's what I'm talking about. There's stuff that we need to pass. These are things that we need to pass from one generation to the other. It ain't right because, you know, Moses was... Moses was one of those amazing men in the word. He, he raised up a Joshua. Even though he couldn't go into the promised land, Joshua was right there. You see, and when Joshua, but the problem is that Moses passed the baton. Moses did what he was supposed to do. He, be, he, he raised up Joshua behind him, but Joshua didn't do the same thing. And so after Joshua, the Bible said the next generation did not know the Lord. I don't want that to be said of me. That I, can you guys come? I, I'm calling my children because I want to do this. You know, I don't want it to be said of me that I didn't pass the baton. It is my job along with my husband to give them Jesus. The God that I serve. I tell them all the time, heaven won't be the same if I looked around and all these people that we preach to are there. And God says, here is your fruit. And I look and I see, oh, uh, a sea of people, but I can't see Terrence. And I can't see Tanya. And I can't see Tania. I'm telling you, heaven just won't be the same. Heaven won't be the same. I need to know that my generations, I can't do all of this. And then my generation miss God. I got to see. I need to know that I'm passing the baton. Can you pass me that baton, please, Bishop? Because he has the baton. Pass me the baton. Thank you. I need my, where's Lily? Where's Liliana? I need Liliana real quick. Come on, Liliana. Come on up here, y'all. I need to show you guys. Come on, come on. Yeah, no, we need you up here. Why is she giving instructions down here? She ought to know by now. I'm the one with the mic. I give the instructions. Come on. I need you all to stand here. Come on. I need you right here, Tanil. Then I need Illy. Come on, then I need you, Gracie. These are my, my this is my, this is, this is my generation. So I need you all to look this way, okay? Gracie, move up a little bit. I'm just making a point here, y'all. She's so cute. <laughs> all right, turn this way. All right, praise the Lord. Okay. You see, passing the baton, I want to do this because you got to see. That's why examples... That's why values are so important, you see, because I'm holding this baton in my hand. But if I don't live right, because either way, I'm going to pass something. I'm going to pass something. Something is going to pass. When I hold this baton, I pass it. If my life, if I have addiction, 
sexual perversion. I ain't living right. I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff talking about it's my life. That is a lie from the pit of hell, by the way. Your life is connected to other lives and it directly affects. So it is not just your life. So I want you to know that when you hold this baton, remember everything that you do. Maybe I don't see. Maybe Bishop doesn't see. Maybe Minister Arlene doesn't see. Maybe Jason doesn't see. But God sees. And this is a spiritual thing. Whatever we live, it's in the baton. And I'm telling you, that's why we got to live right. We got to make wise choices. Because it's not just up to me. I am passing on something to my next generation. So what I want to do... You got to understand. It matters to me. It matters to me. How I pass this baton. What I deposit in my next generation. Because let me just tell you. Whatever I give to them. I give it to them to carry. And it is not their fault. So what we have to do. Is we got to make sure. What we put in this baton. As we walk through life. You see life. Is the relay. The baton is the word of God. And how we walk it through. Matters. So when I began to walk. She's waiting. That's my next generation. And I am going to pass it on to her. And I got. Let me just tell you all. Let me just tell you all. Let me just tell you guys. We live. We really try to live this thing. Because you know why we believe this thing. I believe what God says with everything in me. So we give. We give till it hurts. Because we're digging wells. Because I want my next generation to say thank God for Papa and for Nana. Because they left some wells for us to come and drink from. So when I pass it to her now, I'm saying to Neil, this is my life. It's everything that I did for God. But remember, if I didn't do anything for God and I just made bad decisions, I thought it was okay to go clubbing, all of that stuff I'm passing. But if I live right, if I didn't say perfection, because none of us are perfect, we miss it sometimes, but we try with everything in us. And I pass it over to her and I said to Neil, run your race. I have ran my leg. It is your turn. Now you run your race. And then she is going to take that race and she's going to pass it to Illy. And I'm going to say, Illy, remember, it is not just to Neil. You're standing on mine and Papa's shoulders. And to Neil is standing on my shoulder. So you stand on Nana and Papa and those who prayed for us. And then you are standing on top of that. And then here comes Gracie. Gracie, you got to take this baton. You got to live right. You got to serve God with your whole heart. You are not too young to serve God. God loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And you're going to be great before the Lord. You're going to do great things because we have laid the foundation. This is my generation. Oh, God. Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Jesus. Oh, God. Church, we got to run our race. We have a race that we're running. And we have a baton to pass. It is not just your life. You got to pass it on. And you got to do it well. So that the next generation can be thankful to God for you. And your next generation would curse God and curse you. But they will take that which you've lived and what you've passed on. And they will send it so there wouldn't be a break in the generation. 
And you wouldn't be and I wouldn't be like Joshua who said there was a generation that came up after me that didn't know the Lord. I can't have that on my watch, you all. I can't do that. I'm working hard at this so that my generations will have something to keep going for. And I pray that you all hear me. You hear my heart. You hear the voice of Jesus as he's saying, live, live, do it right, do it right. Do it right. You know, in a relay, it's not important. No matter how much you ran your leg well, it doesn't matter because if you passed the baton and you didn't do it right, then your whole team is disqualified. So you got to make sure that it's not just about you. That's why I tell you, it is not just your life. It is not just your life. You have a baton that you must pass. Pass it well. Pass it well. It is our, re- our responsibility to call the next generation into purpose. The devil is after them. But we, we have to think all prayer. We can get on our knees and cry out to God. But we can't just pray. We must be a good example of what it is. And we must give them good values. Teach it to them. Over and over again. I'm telling you as I look at Gracie. Oh, I see Gracie just ripping it up for Jesus. So I know that the enemy is going to try to get her early. But we've already built a butt line around her. And we've already called her and marked her for Jesus. When I pray for them in the nighttime. I mark all of them. I say, God, I thank you for the day that you already marked that they're going to be saved. I cover all of them from my oldest grand, Issa, all the way down to, to Kobe. I cover all of them. And I thank God that Bishop also cries out to God and call all, all their names. And then I have some spiritual children that I'm telling you I cry out to God for. I carry you all. I carry you all as a mother hen. And I am telling you, I see great things for the generation to come. I'm expecting you all to run with the baton. And I expect you all to also pour into the next generation. That long after Bishop and I are no longer here. Generations Church will still be standing years. Years upon years later. The word of God will be preached. And there will be a generation that will always contend for the faith. Because we honor the Lord. We tried with everything we have to do this right before the Lord. Contend for your generations. You know, they're Deborahs in the next generation. Full of wisdom. They're Esthers. World changers. They came in for such a time as this. They're fierce. And they're going to go in and do that. They're Hannah's full of intercession. They're Simon of Cyrene. The one that got out and helped Jesus with the cross. There's Paul. There's Apostle of Apostles. There's so much. There's Luke's doctors. There's presidents coming up. And you can't do that if you don't have Jesus. I'm telling you. Keep your eyes fixed on him. The author and the finisher of your faith. He's going to do it for you. He's going to do it in your season. This God has brought us all together for such a time as this, for such a season as this. And I am telling you, we have got to walk this thing out. And let us not wait. They're not too young. You know, the 13, 43% of kids, most, the best time. It's under 13 to get them to serve the Lord. So we gotta, we have work to do. We have batons to pass. And we have generations to push forward for the gospel of Jesus. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The generations. The generations are waiting. The generations need us to walk. And the next generation, there are about four generations right here in this church. That's what we're called generations. We have many of you who God's hand is on for good. So that you can do good things for his glory. Amen. I just want to pray for the mothers as we get ready to close right now. I just thank you 
If you allow me to just preach the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. Lifting up mothers everywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of motherhood. We celebrate mothers and all that they do. Thank you, Lord, for the special role that you've given to mothers and the roles that they play in so many lives. Thank you for the unconditional, faithful love, the sacrificial kind of love that mothers give. We pray that you will bless every mother everywhere with good health, with happiness, with peace, with joy, God. Grant them wisdom and strength and courage, Lord. I pray, God, that they will be able to discipline when they need to and not be afraid or ashamed, oh God. But help us, Lord, so that we'll raise our children up in your fear and admonition, Lord God. That they will know you, God, that we will not have our generations far away from you. But we will, they will come to you, God. And they will know you. I just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Father. As we're standing, I just want to make a call for those who are here. We're so glad you came today. But you might be here, but you, you don't know Jesus. Maybe you haven't surrendered your life to him. Maybe you did a long time ago. And let's say, you know what, Pastor Shay? I, I need to, I, I just realized that I got the baton in my hands and I'm running. And I realized that some of the things on this baton, uh, it shouldn't be. So I, I, I need a reset. God will reset you right now if that's what you want. He'll reset you, he'll give you a new start, or he'll give you a start, whichever you want. If that's you, I just want you to say this prayer after me, and then we'll um, ask you who you are. We want to just give you some stuff, help you on your way. I just want you to know that over almost 35 years now, I, I had the same, I was in a bad place. A very bad place and I somebody told me if I call him the Lord I will be saved and he will change my life when I did that I never thought that God would use me but look where I am standing today by the grace of God the same God that did it for me over 30 some years ago will do it for you right here today in your seat so would you just repeat after me Lord here I am needing a restart or a fresh start come Lord would you forgive me of my sins wash me in your blood make me worthy again God I know I have the baton in my hands and I have to pass it I want to pass it right I want to pass it well I want to give something good to my next generation. So I thank you for your help. I surrender my life to you. And I thank you that today I am saved. Thank you because I am your child. I am a child of God. Amen.